In this video, I'm gonna show you how I built this outdoor kitchen completely from scratch, starting with metal framing and onto stuccoing with cement board and finally finishing with a concrete countertop thanks to Concrete Countertop Solutions. This build is absolutely a DIY project that you can get done in a couple of weeks. I'll detail all of the costs. Let's get started. In this video, I'm gonna show you every step that I took to make this beautiful outdoor kitchen. I started with this job site, which is essentially this existing pergola. The problem is this thing is really rickety. Yeah, it was that kind of build. We have a lot of things to overcome with this job site. The ground is more or less level, surprisingly, but it has a lot of peaks and valleys over the course of these pavers. And these posts are not in alignment. In fact, they're not even plumb. So we're going to overcome that over the course of this build. Let's get started. We're doing the framing out of metal, and I learned how flexible metal is when I transported it for the first time. I am a big proponent of efficiency in the shop. I wrote down my measurements. It's a 10 by 10 pergola, so that's kind of what we're filling up with an L-shaped barbecue. And I'm a hobbyist metal worker, so I thought I'd be smart and I'd bring my metalworking tools. The jury is definitely out on whether or not you need this. I don't think you do. So here's my first tip. Get serrated tin snips, cut both of the short ends and actually just bend the studs back and forth like 10 times and it will snap with a perfect line. Or you can annoy your neighbors. When you're doing metal framing, you have two components. You have the channel, which is sort of the bottom and top part, and you have the studs, which have these holes for pass-through of conduit and other pipes and things like that, which I'm not using, so they're totally not in alignment on my project. It's probably not standard to do it that way, but I really didn't want to use up materials just to line those up. And uh, I screwed them together with self-tapping screws. Yeah, did I mention it was my first time using metal studs? One thing you'll notice is that the metal stud is actually very floppy when you first put it together, and it becomes stronger over time, particularly when you notch and overlap pieces like I'm doing here. You really just have to screw them through with uh, self-tapping screws. I don't spend time pre-drilling, and I definitely didn't use the clamps after I tried it for a while, and it seemed to be a waste of time. My one tip for you, though, is that if you're screwing into the short side of a stud, Offset the screw a little bit towards the reinforced corner and not the floppy end. It'll make your life a lot easier. I continued batch cutting my studs until I had my structure more or less together. One other tip is that installing one side at the proper spacing and then using a square to make sure that you're doing everything correct is a great way to get it done. Then we moved this structure into its final location. The reason that I was building it in the garage in the first place is because it was 105 degrees here on this day, and I just wanted to be sheltered from the weather. But we got it in place, and we could see that it more or less fit, and we wanted to talk about some of the details before I started finalizing this. This cabinet is 24 inches deep. It has some built-in storage underneath, but there's going to be an overhang on the grass side for people to sit at with stools. This means that the countertop is about 36 inches. That's the maximum overhang for our concrete counters, which come into play later on. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. This is the part that will hold our barbecue. And the reason that it doesn't have a lot of studs installed at this point is because I was gonna have to move it back and forth. I ended up building this more so in place, but because it goes against the wall, I wanted to actually lay it down and start to finish the backside because there's only a few inches of clearance. So I essentially did this side and then flipped it back up later. But I realized that as we're moving things around and throwing them on the ground and stuff, I got it out of square. So I kind of muscled it back into place and then I checked each corner measurement, made sure they were the same. That's a good indication that you're relatively square. Next step was using composite decking boards but the saw wasn't working because my brother-in-law had the saw blade installed backwards. I laughed at him for that and then fixed it, and then it cut no problem. The reason that we're using these composite decking boards is so that we can elevate the metal framing off the ground. We want it to not come in contact with water that sits there, 
and just figured it would elongate the lifespan of this barbecue. We bought the cheapest possible decking. You don't need expensive stuff. You're not even gonna see this. It's literally screwed into the bottom of the cabinet. And I'll show that in a second. These are about 15 bucks a piece for a 20 foot length, I believe, and I needed two of them. I'll show all of the pricing for all of the things that I use towards the end of the video. Just checking to make sure I was cutting relatively square freehand, and I was. So batched out the rest of these and took them over to the cabinets which were laying on their fronts and got to installing them. This next step is a little unconventional, but I think it works for a barbecue. Normally on a house, you'd use something called a weep screed, which goes behind your siding. And basically if any water gets behind there, it can travel down and drip out from these edges. It also gives you a nice place to finish your siding. So I needed three quarters of an inch, which I couldn't find at the big box store. So I found this channel, which will do a job. I don't know if I need holes in the bottom. I'm not really worried about water intrusion, but I drilled them anyway. And then I installed them to my framing. I made sure to leave a little bit of a gap at the bottom so that you can see that uh, composite decking there. And you'll never see this when it's upright, but it gives it a little bit of an air gap at the bottom. That was important. And the concrete board will slide in there and then my stucco will fill up the rest of that three quarters of an inch, which means about a quarter inch of stucco. It's not a ton, but you really don't need a lot and I started to install my cement board with the rough side facing out. There's two sides for a cement board. Make sure that if you're doing it my way, you do it with the rough side out. I also made a series of jigs while building this. Just put a little piece of tape so that I knew what the overhang should be because I'm leaving these long for now. They're sitting in the track and sticking out over the top. I used my angle grinder with a masonry blade on it, which obviously is very dusty. You need to wear a mask if you're doing this. Silica dust is no joke. And I kind of regret doing it. There's other ways to cut this that is less dusty and less noisy, but this is a fast way for me. I just went with it. An important detail when you talk about doing stucco over concrete board, and in most cementitious materials, you need to reinforce your corners with this mesh, and you also need to tape your butt joints. In addition to that, a really important detail is using a concrete bonding adhesive. I'm soaking the concrete here, and I've mixed a little bit of water into the bonding adhesive in a spray bottle, and I'm just going to spray that. You let it dry for a little bit, that increases the adhesion of your stucco a lot. Normally when you do stucco on a home, you'll have backer paper and you'll have metal lath to sort of grip and key into the stucco. I saw a lot of questions about this online. You can stucco directly over cement board. Just make sure that you put a liberal amount of concrete bonding adhesive on your surface before you get started and make sure that you wet the surface so that it doesn't suck all the moisture out of your stucco when you apply it. Speaking of stucco, I'm using a premium product. This is stucco that you could do the uh, scratch and brown coat in one go. A tip I have is that once you figure out your water measurement for one bag, 
stick a piece of blue tape on the outside and mark the line so you don't have to keep measuring. That really speeds things up when you're trying to get things done quickly, especially if you're working by yourself. And get it to the right consistency. You kind of want like a thick milkshake consistency. If it's too thick, you're going to be using a lot of muscle and it's going to tire you out. On this day, I had no problem, but I didn't record it because I'm going to show you a whole bunch of stucco in a second. But as you can see, I laid down the base coat of stucco on these parts that are against the wall and also underneath where the stools will go. I mentioned that I left this concrete board long, making a five foot cut with just a couple of inches on this heavy cement board was a lot easier once it was already attached to a structure. I didn't have to worry about it moving around on me. And so I trimmed off this excess, which will now be the countertop surface height. And I did this with the angle grinder again, which again is extremely dusty. <laughs> Definitely wear that mask. It's not a joke. Silica dust can make you very sick. I have these access panels for a concealed storage solution. And the easy way to do this, I left the right hand stud out until I was ready to do this. I lined it up and I, I just pushed it against the flange. I'm using my tin snips to cut a header and a footer, so to speak, um, for the top and bottom of the opening. And I cut it about eight inches long and folded over four inches on either side. You can see the header installed already. This was a way to get me a lot of strength with not a lot of material. I then cut the opening for where the barbecue would go. This required a lot of specialty framing and we threw it in there just to make sure that it fit because the last thing we wanted to do was to create this whole thing and have the barbecue not fit in there. So checking early while we can still change things. It did fit but we learned a few things about the height based on the manufacturer recommendation. There was a little bit of a gap on the bottom and we're looking at that and figuring out how we're going to finish that so that it looks good. Obviously I needed a standoff to represent the thickness of my countertop so it's propped up but we still had space. We added a couple of outlets because there was an existing outdoor outlet right next to this. I don't have footage of the whole process, but I will say I used watertight fittings, conduit, and the outlet covers for everything because this is outdoors after all. There is a GFCI outlet upstream from this, so these are all protected. Obviously, follow your local codes if you're going to do something like this. And now just some final finishing details before we get on to the stucco work. Which, by the way, don't do stucco during a heat wave. I added two different access ports in this kitchen. One goes under the barbecue, and that's to get access to the gas line. And you could put storage in there, but it's not going to be free from spiders and stuff. This other one, I put some pre-finished plywood as a floor and also as a divider between this and the rest of the cabinet so that you can at least have somewhat clean storage for other items. As I'm wrapping up the duo rock, I should say again, definitely wear a mask and be really mindful when using the angle grinder in this way. The dust is no joke and the angle grinder is no joke, so be careful. Finalizing the butt joints with the alkaline resistant tape. Here's probably my best tip. Use this adhesive when you're doing it over concrete board, but when you're mixing your stucco and it's 100 degrees, realize that you screwed up. You should have done this early in the morning. You should have probably mixed it a little bit looser or gone and found some retarder to put into your material to make sure that doesn't set too quickly on you. I struggled to do this. I did get it done ultimately, but if you want to learn how to do plaster the right way, go find Kirk Giordano 
on YouTube. He's the best resource. He's where I learned. And honestly, he would have said, you can either use your skill or you can use your muscle. He prefers to use his skill. And part of the skill in doing stucco is to realize that if it's too hot, to show up early or to use the proper materials. And I didn't do either of those things and I suffered for it. So don't be like me. Make sure that you plan accordingly, especially if you're trying to do this in the middle of a heat wave, which I definitely do not recommend. This is the longest day by far. But the key is that you want it to adhere well. You want to leave yourself a relatively smooth surface. And I just powered through it. Some of my material ended up on the ground just drying on me. I could tell you a lot of different ways, but don't be like me. And ultimately, I got it done with a decent result. And this is still going to get covered over, so I wasn't that concerned. But when doing smooth stucco, you know, the base coat can dictate how smooth you can get it. So I really tried here. On this final pass, even though I was in direct sunlight, I mixed it a little looser with a little more water and got closer to that milkshake consistency. And it actually was a lot easier. So take it from me. Even though my technique is not conventional, mix it a little looser if you're in the heat and um, you'll have a better result and you'll use a lot less energy. You could see all the dried up stucco there in the corner that was falling onto my piece of cardboard. That was not a good day. I'm glad to be done with it. The next step in the process was the concrete countertops. Now there is a sand topping mix that we used in addition to the liquidcrete system by Concrete Countertop Solutions. The really cool thing about this system is that there are plastic forms that come in all different profiles. You screw them down into your existing countertop and they fill in with concrete and the proper overhang without having to be full thickness the whole way. That gives you a nice finished look. There's different profiles. and at the end, they snap away to give you a great smooth finish. Okay, full disclosure, Concrete Countertop Solutions sent me this product to use, but I would recommend it either way because I'm a guy who's built his entire kitchen out of concrete. I use the melamine and form method to basically create a bunch of different pieces. This is better for a number of reasons. Number one, you don't have to move it into place. You can cut these forms with regular woodworking tools. You can tape your mitered corners together so that you have a nice tight seam. And there's a system for reinforcing the concrete using this fiberglass mesh and these standoffs that keep the mesh right in the middle of your concrete. They work by snapping into the mesh and they hold it at a certain height. You can either screw it in beforehand or attach them and then screw it in after. I had a ton of help on this day, so I let them deal with that while I worked on the outside of the form. If I had done this the way I did in my kitchen, I would have to carry hundreds, if not thousands of pounds of concrete. I would have to deal with seams in my countertop and I would have to deal with the rebar. Anyway, just check out Concrete Countertop Solutions. So we have an overhang of one foot on this side and we also have a drop in cooler and also the barbecue area that needed to be framed out with plywood at the same height as our forms. This is because you need a straight edge. You don't want the overhang in those areas. And we're all ready to pour. Make sure that you're ready before you start mixing concrete because otherwise you're going to have a bad time. So on to the actual pouring itself. We used sand topping mix from Quickcrete. And for each of these bags, you use one bag of the Liquicrete system, which has fibers for reinforcement, and it has other additives that help the concrete flow better. And one person was on the drill, the other people were helping lift the buckets and just support that person while I was spreading the concrete around. The first pour that we had was a little stiffer than I think you should be aiming for if you're gonna do this. You really want it to be as liquid as possible without compromising the strength so that it flows within the mesh uh, adequately. 
This is probably more the texture that I was looking for. With it this loose, we were able to push it around pretty easily, get it into all the cracks and crevices using a trowel. And this is important at this point. You want to fill up your form to the top level, but don't overfill it too much or you're going to have a mess on your hands. Believe it or not, I forgot my sander, which I was going to use to vibrate the forms, but we used this muscle uh, recovery gun and you can see the bubbles popping at the surface there. You want to take a couple passes around with something that vibrates pretty significantly to get the air bubbles out of the surface of your concrete. And then we just kept filling. My calculations were really tight on this. We ended up using every single bag that we had. I definitely recommend doing the calculation yourself, but adding a couple extra bags because you really don't want to run out, and we were dangerously close to doing that, but everything worked out. Next up is screeding, and this is just a long straight edge that can bridge across both sides of your form, and this allows you to do a sawing motion and fill up the level that you need so that you have a generally filled in form, and if you miss any spots, you can go back as I'm doing there and just throw some concrete in the spot where you missed and you're all good. Next up, use a magnesium trowel. This is extremely important because of how the magnesium reacts to the cementitious material. Something about the water in it, I don't know exactly why the science is the way it is, but you want to use magnesium for this step and you're trying to get a semi-smooth texture. Just light pressure, move it around and get something that looks halfway decent. You're going to come back and do another finishing pass with a steel trowel after this. So no worries if it's not completely perfect. I should mention that we did this pour at night because it was in the triple digits every day that I was building this barbecue. And that actually did affect the drying time. You don't want to do this in triple digits for sure, but we had to wait a little bit longer than the two hours for it to solidify to be able to use the steel trowel. The next day, or 24 hours later basically, we were able to peel this thing off, which is probably the most satisfying part of the entire process. The Z form from Concrete Countertop Solutions couldn't have been easier. I mentioned before, they just snap off and you don't see the part that's underneath that remains in the form. But the other detail is that the surface is almost glass smooth, except for the top edge where you've got a little bit of excess concrete. That comes off with just a little bit of sandpaper. Now we poured at night and it was 1 a.m. when we finished. I missed a couple of spots here, so I had to take my hand sander and take down a few of the rough spots. Ultimately, that was very easy as long as you do it in the first, say, day or so. That worked great. And the final step for the concrete was gonna be to apply a sealer, which I'll show later in the video. Next up, I got the tile saw out. The reason we wanted to put a tile decorative border on this is for a couple reasons. One, to class it up, make it look a little bit interesting and also to match it to the garage, which was across the way. There's one single step with the same tile that we installed so that the backyard looked cohesive. So I grabbed this piece of plywood that was representative of the grout plus the tile that I was going to install and drilled it into the surface of the stucco so that I could use it as support. I made sure that it was level so that everything was going to look good and gravity wasn't gonna fight me. Then I started trimming all my tiles. I learned a long time ago, it's best practice to make your cuts before you actually start. You can dry fit your tiles and it will be a lot smoother of a process than if you're going and trying to cut one by one. Don't tile with your camera really close to your tile saw. I applied the thin set which was a little difficult because it was a small space now. And I have these excess pieces as a ledger on this short side. I installed my corner first because I wanted to make sure that was kind of the most critical part. As you can see here, this is why you miter. I 
placed all my tiles, making sure to use the right size trowel. Usually the smaller notches are for smaller tiles. This is kind of a medium sized tile, four and a quarter by four and a quarter. Make sure that you wet down the surface of the stucco so that the adhesion is really good. And then just go around the border. Now that the tile was in, and here's the step I was talking about to tie in the two elements of the backyard. The next step is Santa Barbara Smooth Mission Finish. It comes in a 90 pound bag and you gotta get this from a specialty store. I found that cutting the bag in half was great because you can mix about half a bag in a five gallon bucket and you add a little bit of powder additive to determine the color. Here's what I'll tell you if you want smooth stucco. This stuff mixes the same but the difference is you do not want the aggregate to come out. With traditional stucco, you use a sponge float and you pull out the sand. In this case, use a steel trowel. Stainless is better because rust won't appear in your finished result. And just try to leave the smoothest surface you can with the trowel. It's a lot like drywall mud. And if you get any particles in your material, you're gonna have a bad time. So use a clean bucket. With this traditional Santa Barbara Smooth Mission, it will develop micro cracks pretty much no matter what you do. You're gonna do one coat, let it crack a little bit, and then do a second coat over and you'll have a good result. Now that I've shown you all the steps that I took to make this outdoor barbecue setup, I will tell you the rough cost of everything. Your cost is probably gonna differ slightly if you're in a different region than I am. And also your project is probably gonna differ a little bit, but I'll give you some high level rough cost ideas. In order of their appearance roughly, the steel studs were about $450. The screws that go with the steel was about 36 bucks. The cement board that goes on top of the steel was about $150 for 12 or 13 sheets. I needed Stainless gas things, and extension fittings for the gas line so that the barbecue hard. could work. That was about a hundred bucks with the gas line Steals within 10 feet of where it was going. The, the electrical to add a couple outlets was Honestly, about 70 bucks all said, and I used waterproof fittings square. so that added to cost. I needed so concrete, about 12 bags of the sand topping mix, which was about 120 bucks to buy the form set from Concrete Countertop Solutions. I had some odds and ends like metal drip edge for 80 bucks, which wasn't that cheap. Silicone tape, plastic, 60 bucks. We're in the weeds now. The Vivor stainless steel doors were about 300 bucks. You can get those on Amazon. And all of these materials generally, except for the stucco, was purchased from big box store. So can you do it for less? Probably a little bit you should expect to spend between three and $4,000 to build a 10 by 10 outdoor kitchen in material cost alone, not labor. So that's back in the napkin math for you. Hopefully that helps. My name is Nick. This is Design is Blank. I make DIY projects. I do woodworking, a little bit of metalworking, and general design. And if you like that type of stuff, go ahead and subscribe. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments and I'll get back to you on this. Happy to answer anything that comes up. Good luck on your project. Talk to you later. Bye.